Throughout the ages of the earth, rich men have pondered, wise men have wandered. A savior was born. The redeemer was sacrificed. Nations emerged. Armies crumbled, just as God said. God said, I am the I am. So what? Follow me. Now? Let them come. Everyone? Remember? Huh? Got God issues? God has said a lot of things, important things, and they're recorded in the pages of the Holy Bible. Unfortunately, too often, our response has been, so what? What does it matter? Does it make any difference? That's what this series is about. And our topic this hour is no fear. And our speaker is Pastor John Bradshaw. Pastor Bradshaw has spent a lot of quality time studying what God said. And he loves to share what he's learned and help us to understand why it matters. But just before he talks with us, we want to hear some good music. Mark Trethaway is um, a vocalist and composer, and he's going to be singing his own composition, Gethsemane. He entered in the garden, his disciples at his side. The magnitude of that dark hour began to fill his mind. He said to his disciples, I want Peter, James, and John. The rest of you can stay right here as we go farther on. He said, my soul is sorrowful. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and he fell down on his knees. He felt the sins of all mankind engulf his weakened frame. He feared he'd lose his father's love and never be the same. Gethsemane, Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed alone. Gethsemane, Gethsemane, where God's great love was shown. Gethsemane, Gethsemane, was where he took our place. Gethsemane, for you and me and all the human race. On that dark night he bore alone the awful weight of sin. His own disciples did not stay awake to comfort him. His sweat came forth, his drops of blood in painful agony. He felt sin's awful separation for eternity. He groaned aloud in agony, his heart was filled with dread. His human nature trembled there, and this is what he said. My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but thine be done. I'll drink it all for thee. Gethsemane, Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed alone. Gethsemane, Gethsemane, where God's great love was shown. Gethsemane, Gethsemane, was where he took our place. Gethsemane, for you and me and all the human race. The devil whispered in his ear, 
It isn't worth the price Your own disciples won't appreciate your sacrifice But Jesus rose up from that place Contentment filled his soul He would accept the awful fate To cleanse and make us whole He woke up his disciples And encouraged them to pray A darker hour awaited them When they would run away He saw the torch-led mob That Judas led out to that place The Judas' betrayal kiss was placed upon his face Gethsemane, Gethsemane where Jesus prayed alone Gethsemane, Gethsemane where God's great love was shown Gethsemane, Gethsemane was where he took our place Gethsemane for you and me and all the youth and race Gethsemane for you and me and all the human I'll never forget her. When I met her, I noticed she was different right away. There was something about her that was just a little different. When I met Mary Ellen, I knew it. She was different. I looked at her and I thought, I can see some very real differences about her. I wasn't sure just what the difference was, but there was a certain X factor, if you like. I noticed that Mary Ellen's hair was different. As I looked at her, I noticed that her clothing was a little bit, how should we say, different. I noticed that her makeup was a little, what word am I looking for? <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> different. And her jewelry was a little bit, well, we're on a roll here. Her jewelry was just a little bit different. And I didn't know why. I just didn't know why. We got talking, and before long, we started talking about spiritual things and, and church attendance and so forth. And Mary Ellen said to me, well, you know, John, I used to go to church, but now I don't. Well, I do, sort of. And I didn't know what that meant, so I didn't kind of stay there very long, and we carried on talking. And then she said it again. I used to go to church, but now I don't anymore. And then she said with a kind of a wry little grin, she said, but I do sort of. By now she had me as curious as anything, and I said to her, Mary Ellen, what do you mean that you don't go to church anymore? How did she put it? She doesn't go to church anymore, but she does sort of. What does that mean? And then she said this. She said, John, let me explain something to you. I was raised in a hellfire and brimstone spitting she named the denomination, which, which I won't do. I was raised in a hellfire and brimstone spitting church. And I'd go to church for as far back as I could remember, even as a little child. And the preacher would tell us that if people didn't go to heaven, if people didn't love Jesus, if people were lost, they'd go to hell. And hell was where they would burn forever and ever and ever, even little babies who weren't saved would go to heaven and they'd roll around on the hot waves of the flames of hell and they'd burn eternally and they'd never stop burning up. She said to me, I decided after a while that if God was like that, I'd be better off without him. So I don't go to church anymore and I haven't for years. And then she said, well, I do sort of. I said, Mary Ellen. And then she said that little thing that explained everything. She said, well, John, these days, I'm a witch. And that explained it, the makeup, the hair, the jewelry, the clothing, all the, I looked around for a broomstick, looking around. 
I remember there was a little red car parked in the driveway, no broomstick. I didn't know what to do, run, talk, watch. She said, I'm a witch. And she explained about her witch church. <laughs> she told me which church she went to. She talked about the sorts of things they did. And it just, it dawned on me, this was shocking. Here was a young lady who had turned her back on God and had voluntarily gone off and become a servant of the devil himself because of what she was told about God in church. Really, Mary Ellen was only intellectually honest. Who'd want to serve a God like that? This business of the afterlife. This business of the afterlife has, has people confused all over the place, all around the world. And if you stop and think and ask some questions and listen to what people are saying, you'll find there's an almost infinite variety of different takes on what happens when a person dies. Now, some people say when you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. You go to heaven and everything is happy, or you go to hell and you burn and you burn and you burn and you burn. Now, of course, there are some Christian friends and they believe if you're not good enough to go to heaven and not bad enough to go to hell, you go to a kind of a halfway place where you work off your sins and suffer a little for a period of time called purgatory. Now, there are others who say uh, that when you die, you, you come back and you live again, but you live in another form, maybe as a dog or a cat or a roach or a bug or something like that. They believe in reincarnation. And you and I might think, wow, that's weird. But there's lots of people who believe in reincarnation. Absolutely. Just as strongly as you believe what you believe. Some people say, ah, you die, there's nothing. Nothing at all. It's common today for people to believe that after a person dies, they can come back to the earth and communicate with the people that they left behind. That's why folks have seances. So that they can communicate, they think, with their loved ones who left this mortal coil and went on before them. A husband might come back and visit a grieving wife. A departed wife might come back and visit her grieving husband or perhaps the children that she left behind. I recall watching a television program, and on this TV program was a lady named Denise Brown. Now, you know who she is. O.J. Simpson was accused of killing his wife, Nicole Brown Simpson. Her sister, very much alive, was Denise Brown. On this television program that I saw, Denise Brown was put in connection with a man named James von Prague. James von Prague is a, a psychic or a mystic or a medium or some such thing. And he said to Denise, would you like to be put in touch with Nicole? And Denise said, oh, sure I would. And then he started to tell Denise some things that she was convinced could only have been revealed by Nicole. Oh, only Nicole could know that. Oh, that's true. Nobody in the world would know but her. I was interested to know that she never ever said whether O.J. did it or not. And surely that's what everybody wanted to know. But Denise said, this has got to be my sister. This has got to be Nicole. And she was convinced that Nicole had spoken to her from the other side. It was interesting that what von Prague said afterwards was, Denise, let me make this simple. What you've been involved in is nothing other than a good old-fashioned seance. Interesting from a man who says, my work is very powerful. It is God's work. He says that he is a doorway to the other dimension, a doorway to the life force. He says that what he is doing is ordained and blessed and anointed by God. Well, tonight what we're going to find out is whether Mr. Von Prague has been doing God's work and whether my friend Mary Ellen really needed to leave the church. Is God really like she was told God was like. One thing is certain, and that's this. If Jesus doesn't come back first, all of us are going to die. That's for sure. Every last one of us. People think about death often with fear, often with foreboding, scared of death, don't know what's going to happen over there on the other side. Sometimes this eats people up and, and ruins their lives. I know that even Christians, many of them, very uncertain about what happens when you die. And maybe that's because of this seeming infinite variety of explanations for what happens when a person does die. You might be surprised to know that the Bible says a lot about what happens when a person dies. Tonight we're going to find out what the Bible says. We will find out the Bible is not indistinct. It's not muddy and murky. It's clear, crystal clear. And I believe, friend, tonight we can trust 
what the Bible says. Can you say amen tonight? Thank the Lord. We're going to trust what the Bible says. And if we want to know what happens at the end of a person's being, we need to go all the way back to the beginning. We'll go back in our Bibles to Genesis, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, notice this, the breath of life. And then the Bible says, The man became a living soul. I want you to notice that. God had two components. He formed man out of dust, had this inanimate man, gave him mouth to mouth. The man became alive. And the word of God says the man became a living soul. Now that's important. The words are important because the Bible runs counter to what is being said in even a lot of churches today. Now, I'm not sure about you. I can't be. But when I was a child, I was told that I had a soul and that this was something that was going to leave my body at death and if I played my cards right my soul would go to heaven and my soul would go to be with God it would go to be with Jesus after I died I was told that when I died I wouldn't really be dead the body might go into the ground but my soul would go on living so really I was told that once I was dead then I was really living now that's very interesting the Word of God does not say that we have a soul. And you might say, oh, come on, man, does it matter? You're telling me what God said? I say, so what? I'm going to tell you something. When you know the truth about this, it matters immensely. Have you ever heard about a silly season named Halloween? What's Halloween? It's just a great big celebration of, well, spiritualism, isn't it? People decorate their houses. I never figured that out. Festooning their driveways and their yards with skeletons and tombstones and ghosts and ghouls and flying witches and all kinds of things like that. Halloween is just like one great big scary movie coming into your home for a week or two. The idea is look out because the ghosts or the ghouls or the goblins, they're all going to get you. But wait a minute. The spirits are going to get you. Hold up time out if it's true that when you die you don't have a soul the soul doesn't go anywhere doesn't that change Halloween a whole lot sure it does what about those scary movies you watched Friday the 13th then Nightmare on Elm Street I guess I'm dating myself and all those other scary movies you watched once upon a time and the guy was dead but he came back from the dead and they buried him in the grave and he climbed out of the grave Wait a second, this changes all of that. If when you die, you're dead, and you don't go on living, none of that matters. None of that's real. I'd take you for a walk through a graveyard at 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't care if the wind is blowing, if the gate creaks out there at the front of the cemetery. I don't care if the wind is blowing, autumn time, leaves blowing all around. That's all right with me. You know something, Eve was talking to the snake, you know, Genesis chapter 3. And the devil said, did I say Eve was talking to the snake? That's right, Eve was talking to the snake. The devil threw the snake, said to Eve, has God really said that you cannot eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And Eve said, that's right, can't eat it. If we eat it, we die. And the devil said, you shall not surely die. People have believed what the devil said. And interestingly enough, that's the first lie recorded in all of the Bible. The folks in the cemetery shouldn't cause you any worry at all. It's the people who are still alive that you ought to be worrying about, not the people who are dead. The dead, according to the Bible, are dead. You know, you can sleep at night soundly, knowing that some ghost isn't going to get you. Oh, I believe in haunted houses. I believe the devil does some crazy things, but I can tell you who it's not. I can't always explain who it is, but I can tell you it's not the spirits of the dead who've come back from the other side. In fact, Job said, Job 7, about verses 8 through 10. Job said that the dead do not come back after their death and visit their house. So if you've got noises in your attic, then you thought that might be Uncle Larry, or it might be the previous occupant of the house, or something like that. You know what? It's probably just possums or raccoons or <laughs> lizards or something or other running around up there. It's not Uncle Larry. I sat with a lady in the living room of her house one time, and she said, that room down the hallway, and I looked. 
when Uncle Larry was sick, we had him in that room, and he died in there. And then after he died, you know, we took him off and had the funeral and so forth. After the funeral, I went into Uncle Larry's room, she said, and music started playing. And I stepped out of the room, and music stopped. She said there was no radio, no stereo, no boom box, none of that. But the music started when I went in, and the music stopped when I went out. So I went in, music, out, no music. And she kind of played with us for a few moments. She said, I figured that was Uncle Larry's way of telling me that he was okay. Well, I've got another take on that. I read the Bible. Uncle Larry wasn't coming back from where he went, according to what the Word of God says. The Bible says Uncle Larry doesn't have, never had a soul that when he died, went any old place. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible teaches Adam was a combination of body and breath. And when those two things came together, he became a living soul. So a soul is not something that you have. A soul is something that you are. You might have heard it said about old Auntie Ethel. She was a dear old soul. You know what I'm talking about? In the Bible, it says in, in the book of Acts, there were 276 souls in a certain boat that Paul was on. He wasn't talking about ghosts or wispy spiritual spooks or any other thing like that. He was talking about folks, people. A soul is a living being in the which is the breath of life. That makes things plain. In the Bible, there's a story that illustrates this perfectly. Jesus happened to be very good friends with Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. They lived in the town of Bethany. Jesus was away with his disciples one time, and word came that Lazarus was really sick, very sick. And the disciples expected that what Jesus would do would go on back and heal him. Well, that's not what Jesus decided to do. Jesus said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to go there and wake him up. Now the disciples were excited about that. Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought that he meant natural sleep. So then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is what? Lazarus is dead, just like that. Now Jesus described Lazarus' condition as being like a sleep like resting, sleeping, just as you would sleep tonight or on any other night when you got a good night's sleep. Lazarus was dead. Jesus said Lazarus is asleep. Jesus equated death with sleep. Now, it's a dreamless sleep, and you're not going to be aware of how much time passed. I don't think anybody's going to wake up in the resurrection and say, whoa, that one seemed to take a very long time. Glad to be getting out of there with my bad back. No, people will sleep. The very next thing they will know is that Jesus has come and the saved will go to be with Jesus. A certain amount of time will pass. Goodness knows how long that will be. But it's going to be just like a sleep, a dreamless sleep. You think this doesn't make a difference? Sure it does. I met a lady, 86 years old. She'd been married to a fellow, ah, 100 years, I don't know, 65, 66 years. Man died. She was tormented. You know why? Because she believed that he was out there somewhere. And she'd walk around saying, Bill, why won't you contact me? Bill, why won't you communicate with me? If only you'd say something to me, I'd feel so much better. Was he going to say something, yes or no? Couldn't possibly. He was sleeping in the grave. Grief is bad enough. Married to someone that long, it's got to be crippling almost. Add to that the mental torture of thinking that your loved one was refusing to communicate with you, led astray by this idea that you had a soul that goes on living after you die. Oh, old Bill wasn't going to communicate with her at all. He was fast asleep, sleeping in the grave. Now back to Lazarus. Jesus decided he was going to go and wake him up. So when Jesus gets to Bethany, he says to Lazarus, his sister Martha, your brother, notice what he said. He said, your brother will rise again. He did not say your brother is in heaven. Lazarus was a good fellow. You'd think he'd be in heaven. Jesus did not say, bad news, your brother's in hell. Didn't say that either. He held out hope. Your brother will rise again. And what did the sister of Lazarus say? He said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha knew the truth about what would happen when a person died. 
she knew that Lazarus, because he had faith in Christ and faith in God, would live again. And that death is only a temporary gap between consciousness in this life and then life in the world to come. But Jesus had made an important decision. He was going to do something special in Lazarus' case. He was going to reveal that he had the keys of the grave. Jesus had power over death. And so this is what he did. Uh, John chapter 11 and verse 43. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And when he who had died came, came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Lazarus came out of the grave, according to what the Bible says. And so then Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Lazarus had been dead in the grave. And if you read this story in John chapter 11, you won't read about Lazarus coming out of the grave and saying, whoa, hot down there, am I glad to get out of hell? Never did that. Nor will you read that Lazarus said, oh, it was nice up there. Why do I have to be? Oh, heaven is so beautiful, let me tell you. He didn't do any of that. Where had he been? He'd been in the grave. What had he been doing in the grave? Sleeping. It had been several days. That man was good and dead. And Jesus woke him up and called his name, Lazarus, come forth. And you know what that means? That was a foreshadowing of what's going to take place on that great day. One day, the saints of Christ are going to rise up and come out of their dusty beds. There's going to be a great getting up morning in the day when Jesus returns. The Word of God says the dead in Christ shall rise. We read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a what? Oh, come on now, with a what? With a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the what? Trump of God. And the dead in Christ will do what? They will rise first. The Word of God goes on to say, and then we, which are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then in verse 17, it's like Paul says, P.S. Now, he never wrote P.S., but it's like he wrote P.S. He says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. See, these words are to be a comfort. A comfort. Oh, no, but John, I'd be more comforted thinking that Grandpa's in heaven watching over me. No, you wouldn't. There are some things you don't want Grandpa sticking his nose into right now. Am I right? There are some things you don't want Grandpa watching. There are some things that Grandpa doesn't want to see. You th <laughs> You think Grandpa would be happy if he looked down here and he sees Grandma suffering with Alzheimer's. Would that be heaven for him? That'd be miserable, wouldn't it? You think Grandpa would like to look down and, and, and see his son drive his motorcycle into the back of a truck and end up de, uh, uh, incapacitated and, and live a very sad life? Would, would that make him hev happy up there in heaven? No, no, no. Would he like to look down and see his relatives in a concentration camp or, 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 or something like that? No, now you've turned heaven into hell. Jesus has a better plan. He lets our loved ones sleep the sleep of death, and then he says, I will come again comfort one another with these words i say that's good news what about you amen. amen thank the lord for that when i was a kid i went to lots of funerals in the church in which i was raised i was an altar boy and so i'd go to funerals like all the time they'd come and get us out of school so we could be altar boys for a funeral went to lots of them and in the church the priest would always say something like and now we can be happy because we know that the granddad is in heaven and he's praising the Lord. And I want you all to be comforted. Now I know what he's attempting to do. He's wanting to comfort grieving family members. I understand that. But then 30 minutes later, we're at the graveyard and now, and now we commit the body of granddad to the grave where he will rest and sleep and wait for the resurrection. And as a kid, my head is spinning and I'm saying, hey, where's granddad? 30 minutes ago, he was in heaven. 30 minutes later, he's in the grave and I cannot see how a dead man can be in two places at once. Where's granddad? Can't be both ways, can it? If you understand the truth, this thing is settled. You know where the dead are. They're sleeping in the grave. No, that's not going to take away your grief. I know there are people listening to this and their hearts are raw because they've experienced grief maybe very recently and you're wrestling with this. I understand that. 
And I feel for you. Grief is ugly. The Bible says that death is an enemy. You know something? The Bible says that that enemy will be destroyed when Jesus comes back. Isn't that good news? The dead in Christ shall rise. Families are going to be put back together, if you know what I mean. Lovers are going to see each other again. Parents will see their children. You'll see those old friends again, those who had faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, it's good news. And when the dead in Christ rise, there'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more cancer, no more high blood pressure. There won't be any more diabetes and no more strokes, no more nursing homes, and none of that to go through anymore. Jesus is going to come back soon. And on the day that the dead in Christ rise, we shall be together with Jesus forever and ever and ever. But wait, doesn't something go back to God when a person dies? Yes. The Bible says that when a person dies, the body goes to the ground and the breath goes back to God. We read that in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. The word of God says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. That's it. We have a spirit that goes to God. Well, yes, we do. But the spirit and the breath are the same thing. I was there when my dad died. I know what happened. I had my arms around him. And when my dad died, he did this. He breathed out. I'd heard my father exhale a gazillion times. But every other time I heard him exhale, I had heard him inhale right after that. But this time, he died. His body went into the grave. Where did the breath go? I knew where it went. It went out, well, into the room. That's where it went. But symbolically speaking, if you like, that breath went back to God in heaven. The power to keep my dad alive was and is resident with God in heaven. So, should God choose to do so, in the resurrection, God will call my father from the grave. His breath will be in him. He will come alive. He lives again. Thank the Lord. Believers in God have got hope and something to look forward to. Amen? Nothing to fear at Halloween. Nothing to fear by characters out of scary movies. No fear, because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And thank the Lord for that. Now wait, I know what somebody's thinking. Ah, but John, how about where the Bible says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? The Bible doesn't say that. And I don't mean it says it, but it doesn't mean it. It just doesn't even say it. It doesn't. The verse we're talking about is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. And here's what it says. Paul said, we are confident. Yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. This was a man who'd been beaten, shipwrecked, stoned, all kinds of things. He had, a, if you understand what he was saying there in the Bible, trouble with his eyes. Other folks often wrote for him because he couldn't see so well. Where do you think he wanted to be? He wanted to be in heaven. Sure he did. He wanted to have a new body. It was his preference to be absent from this body and to get a new body. But we know when he was going to get a new body because he told the same people, the Corinthians, he said this would happen when Jesus comes back and the last trumpet sounds. The Bible makes sense. I can't tell you how many people I've met and spoken to who've said, this has never made sense to me. I've tried to figure out how a person could go to heaven when they die and be in the grave when they die. And lots of people wrestle with this. But you know what? They say, well, if the preacher says it, I guess I just believe it. Or if Oprah Winfrey says it, then I guess I just believe it. Or if Reader's Digest says it, I guess I'll just go right ahead and believe it. You know, friend, we can afford to make the Bible our counselor and our guide. God's Word is certain, and it's sure, and it's true. Now, wait, there's another case in the Bible. We've really got to talk about it. How about the thief on the cross? Didn't Jesus say to him, today you'll be with me in paradise? Here's what happened. It's Sunday morning. Mary Magdalene goes down to the tomb, and she meets Jesus down there. Now, the words, I don't know if they were ringing in her ears or not, but here's what Jesus had said to the thief on the cross on Good Friday afternoon. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Ah, but Sunday morning down there at the tomb, Mary Magdalene's about to give Jesus a big old bear hug, and he says, Don't detain me. Touch me not, because I have not yet ascended to my Father in heaven. 
Now, he tells the thief on Friday, hey, thief, today, me and you, paradise. And yes, paradise is heaven, same place. And then on Sunday morning, he says to Mary, I haven't been to paradise. Was Jesus speaking out both sides of his mouth at the same time? Was he confused? No. Here's what you got to know. Jesus said to the thief, assuredly, I say to you, let's shift that comma. Assuredly, I say to you today, now we put the comma there, you will be with me in paradise. He was giving the thief assurance, the same assurance he gives you. You come to the Lord and you say, but Lord, I'm a sinner. He says, hey, I tell you now, you'll be with me in paradise. I give you assurance now. You don't have to wait for assurance. You don't have, I'm not going to put you on probation. I'm telling you now, I'm giving you something you can bank on. Have no fear, thief. Even though you were a rotten man, a sinner, you're hanging on this cross justly according to the law. I'm telling you now, man, today I'm giving you assurance in the here and now. You will be with me in paradise. How do you think that thief felt hanging on the cross? Oh, in the midst of his agony and anguish and pain, he must have felt wonderful knowing that his sins had been forgiven and eternal life had been promised to him absolutely and verily and truthfully. That thief could have assurance. Now, a comma is an important thing, and please don't be accusing me of monkeying around with the Bible. The punctuation in the Bible was added hundreds of years after the inspired words were written. Most of the time, it was put in the right place. Sometimes it wasn't. This is one of those cases where it wasn't. Many Bibles actually put the comma in the right place. I'm going to show you how important a comma is. A woman without her man is nothing. Now, nobody say amen out there. I'll show you the power of a comma. We shift the comma and we find it now says, A woman without her man is nothing. Oh, hey, wait a minute, no amens. <laughs> you see how powerful a comma can be? Sure. Oh, no, what Jesus was doing was giving the thief confidence, assurance. Today, today there's mass confusion, near-death experiences. I was out of my body. I was looking down. A girl told me, we did all of this cocaine one day, and, 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 and I passed out. They thought I was dead. My friends thought I was dead, so they dumped my body behind a hedge. I said, thank the Lord you weren't doing drugs with your enemies. Dropped a body behind a hedge and she said and then I came up out of my body and I looked down and I saw what was going on she said I think that proves I have a soul I said I think that proves you did too many drugs that day <laughs> here's what scientists suggest they suggest that on occasions when your body is under great stress a little part of your brain called the angular gyrus misfires and that's a little part of your brain that gives you a perception of yourself. And they reckon when it only happens under stress, right? Operating table, the man is about dead, load him with drugs, his body's under great stress. Did you ever hear about a guy sitting on an easy chair at the beach watching the waves roll in, Whew, had an out-of-body experience? <laughs> Never happened, did it? No, it only happens when something really crazy is going on. Your brain can do some pretty weird things. That's what's happening with out-of-body experiences. They're real. They happen. Absolutely. But it doesn't mean that you have a soul. Absolutely not. You know, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Oh, friends, that's good news tonight. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Now, wait a minute. If you go straight to heaven when you die, you don't need Jesus to be the resurrection and the life. In fact, you made him a liar. You got to heaven without him being the resurrection and the life. But Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He, he can come into your life tonight if you are dead. That's dead in sin. If you're a long way from him. If, you've been want, if you're out in the rough someplace, Jesus can come into your life tonight and resurrect that old life. Give you new life. He can be the resurrection and the life for you. And you might say, my life has been worth nothing. I've made a mess. I, I botched it up big time. Wait a minute. When Jesus comes back, if you die in faith in Christ, he'll wake you up. You'll see him again. You'll live again. You'll live forever because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. No fear if you know Jesus. Isn't it good to know Jesus as Savior and Lord and as the resurrection and the life? 
But what about my friend Mary Ellen? Remember the one who was run off out of church because of this Jesus who would burn people forever and ever and ever and ever? I've got some good news for all of the Mary Ellens of this world. What she needed to know, and what I'll tell you right now, is that there is no hell burning right now. Or there'll be a hell, all right? Jesus referred to it. Sure, there'll be a hell. But hell isn't burning right now. Isn't that something? When I was a child, I was told again and again and again, oh man, be careful because you'll join all the wicked folks in hell with it burning now. It's down in the center of the earth. I wondered what would happen if the Shell Oil Company just drilled down far enough. What's going to come gushing out the top of that oil well? Huh. Really? I watched that black and white movie, Journey to the Center of the Earth, like this. They're going to find hell down there. That's what I was told. I don't know about you, but that's what I was told. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus is explaining a parable, and he says, this is the one about the wheat and the tares. He says, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. That's Matthew chapter 13 and verse 39. He goes on to say, the harvest is the end of the age or the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Bible goes on to say in verse 49, I think it is in Matthew chapter 13, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just. Hey, when is that going to happen? Can you tell me? At the end of what? At the end of the age, or in other words, at the end of the world. You might have some relatives who died and you weren't sure about where they were going. Now, maybe we don't know, but we can know for sure they're not burning in hell right now. Because there's no hell burning right now. The Word of God is too clear. It takes place at the end of the age. Was Mary Ellen right about hell? People in there writhing and screaming and groaning and, and, and suffering. My wife and I were driving on Interstate 90, not far from here. We were in Idaho. We stopped at a payphone. This is back in the old days, you know. We stopped to use a payphone. And somebody had been doing their missionary work and had stuck little pink tracts all over the payphone booth. I mean, the place was just wallpapered with them. And I took one down and I began to read. I made some notes. I'm going to read what I read in the tract. The Lord and I went into hell. There were pits of fire as far as I could see. See, Jesus had given this lady a guided tour of hell. Wouldn't that be something? Hell is shaped like a human body lying in the center of the earth. As soon as we were inside, and this amuses me, I began to see great snakes, large rats, and many evil spirits all running from the presence of the Lord. Wait a minute. If hell's going to burn up anything, I reckon it ought to burn up the rats and the snakes. Don't you? But instead, they seem to get a free pass down there. In the next pit was a woman on her knees as if looking for something. Her skeletal form also was full of holes. Her bones were showing through and her torn dress was on fire. Her head was bald. There were holes where her eyes and nose were supposed to be. Tremendous sobs shook her. She cried out, oh Lord, oh Lord, I want out. She finally got to the top of the pit with her feet. I thought she was going to get out. But then a large demon about the size of a grizzly bear, he was dark brown, had broken wings hanging down his back, rushed up and pushed her very hard backward into the pit and fire. I watched in horror as she fell. I felt so sorry for her. So Jesus is going to do that to people. That would make him worse than Hitler, worse than Stalin, worse than Pol Pot, worse than Saddam Hussein. Animals, though they were, they at least put their victims out of their misery, but not Jesus. We pray the prayer, our Father who art in heaven, and then turn around and accuse our Father of being the perpetrator of the worst act of child abuse in the history of the universe. I don't think that's really very fair, and it certainly isn't very right. Notice what the Bible says. Ezekiel 18 verse 4, it says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel 18 4. The wages of sin is what? Death. A little while and the wicked won't be. Why? Because the wicked shall perish according to Psalm 37 and verse 20. That's just too clear. And if you'd like to know how the devil's going to make out on all of this, the Bible tells you. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, the Word of God tells us how the devil's going to come out. It says, Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. And I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the people are astonished at you. 
you have become a horror. It goes on and says this, and you shall be how? No more for how long? The devil's going to be blotted out of existence. The Bible says he's going to be burned up and turned into what? Ashes. That's consistent with the rest of the Bible. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, and all who do wickedly will be stubble, the Bible says. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. It will leave them neither root nor branch. That's Malachi chapter 4. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be what? Ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord. That's what the Bible says. The wicked turn into what? Now listen, I'm going to tell you, that's not pretty either. But you know what God wants to do with hell? God is going to get rid of sin. He wants you to live in a universe where there's no sin. Aren't you sick of sin? You hear those sirens you hear racing off to another tragic accident? That sin was the cause of that in the beginning. Domestic violence and disease and tragedy and death. Come on, man. That's sin. God says, I'm going to get rid of sin. And in the end, he's going to have to get rid of all of the people who choose to connect themselves to sin. He doesn't want to do that. He has no relish doing that. But God is going to get rid of sin. I remember when I was living in London, England, and they had a mad cow disease scare. Whew. Instant vegetarianism. There were vegetarians popping up everywhere because the fear was you eat the cow and you end up with a mad cow disease. They said, the authority said, what do we do to try to contain this thing? And they realized what they had to do. Get rid of the cattle. They slaughtered thousands of head of cattle. You think the farmers were happy doing that? They weren't happy doing that at all. No, they weren't. But they needed to do it because they had to stop the disease from spreading. And so that's what they did. God is going to make sure the disease of sin does not spread all throughout the universe. And so he'll get rid of sin. God's not a tyrant. God's not awful. God is not sick and twisted. God is good. God is love. God wants you to live in a universe where there's just no sin. You can imagine being in heaven, can't you? Where I grew up off the coast of the North Island of New Zealand, there was a volcanic island. Always smoke and steam coming out of the island, White Island. Always. And when you saw that smoke and steam, you knew there's something hot going on down there. Imagine you being saved and knowing that your grandma was lost. And maybe over there was hell. And you could see the smoke or the steam and maybe even hear the screams if you got too close. Don't you think that after a while you'd go to Jesus and say, come on now, Jesus, that's enough. She's been in there for a hundred years, a thousand years, a million years. Lord, she's been in there for a hundred and fifty trillion years. Haven't you proved your point, Lord? Burn her longer. That's awful, isn't it? That's what Christians say. God is like. A friend of mine, his dad was working in a lumber camp in the state of California. And a great big mean son of a gun came to him one day and said, Lewis, is it true that you're teaching people that there's no hell right now and that hell doesn't burn forever? Well, all he could do was tell the truth because he was a Christian. But this man, he was like big bad John. Rumor was he'd killed more than one man with his bare hands. This is a fellow with issues. <laughs> he said, that's what I'm telling people because that's what it says in the Bible. Can you show me that? Sure I can. Come on over to this tent. Sat down, opened up the Bible, and looked at a number of the texts that we've looked at tonight and many others besides. And as they had that little Bible study together, that great big man mountain started to tremble. And his eyes welled up full of tears, and he started to weep like a baby. And great sobs shook his enormous body. When he came to, he looked at my friend's dad. He said, I want to tell you something. Twenty years ago, my son was killed in a barroom brawl. And a preacher told me that he went straight to hell, and that he was burning there now, and he would burn forever. He said, I have hated God ever since. 
You know, when he found out the truth about God, that man's life changed just like that. Isn't that wonderful? He knew that God was not a tyrant. God was not a murderer. God was not an inflictor of misery and pain. God's just not like that at all. In the book of Revelation chapter 20, it will tell you that sinners will be devoured. Oh, wait, but you're going to say in the book of Revelation even, Revelation chapter 14, it'll say that the sinners burn forever and ever. Does it say that? Well, wait a minute. It says the smoke of their torment ascendeth forever. Same thing. Not quite. In the book of Jonah, Jonah says he went down in the belly of that great big fish. He said the earth and her bars were about me forever. How long was Jonah in the belly of that whale? Three days and three nights. It even says it in the book of Jonah. In another place in the Bible, uh, Hannah gives birth to the son that she had wanted so long. She said, I'm going to take him down to the temple and he's going to be in the temple forever. Is Samuel still in the temple over there? That's not possible. Then she went on to say, as long as he lives, he's going to be in the temple. That's what it meant. The Hebrew slave was going to serve his master forever, but they would release them every few years. So forever doesn't always mean forever. Very often in the Bible, forever means just as long as something is going to go for, until it's done, forever. That's like saying, man, the old drought, that drought back in 92, it went forever. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we had that old rainstorm. It just went on forever. I went to hear God said, so what? There was a preacher there. He went. Now, that's not a good illustration at all. That's a bad one. <laughs> that's a bad one. But you know what I mean? See, we say that all the time. Forever. We don't mean forever. You know what it says about God in the Bible in Revelation 21 and verse 4? It says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And here's the good news. There will be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain because the former things are passed away good news jesus is coming back good news the dead in christ shall rise good news we'll live with jesus forever there'll be no more sin no one's going to get sick there won't be any death thank the lord jesus is coming back he's the resurrection and the life you can claim him tonight as your lord and savior you don't even have to be worthy. None of us are worthy. You don't have to be good to claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You don't have to have all your, your ducks in a row and your act all sorted out. You don't have to pull yourself together to claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can say, oh Lord, I cannot save myself. You must save me. Jesus will come into your life and flood your life with peace. He'll take away your old heart. He'll give you a new heart. Your life will never be the same again. Some of those things that you used to love, you're going to start to hate them. Some of those addictions and crutches and habits and, and the things that are making your life misery, make you feel dirty and bad and wrong and yuck. Jesus will take it away. Then he'll forgive you. Oh, I don't know if I can forgive myself. Come on, that's psychobabble. No one ever said you have to forgive yourself. Nobody. You just have to believe that God forgives you. Isn't that right? No one made you God that you've got to go around forgiving yourself. Believe in God's forgiveness. That ought to be enough for you whether you can forgive yourself or not. Oh, but I'll feel guilty. A little guilt goes a long way. You don't want to wallow in guilt. But if you shot somebody in the head, you ought to feel bad about that a few years later on. That might keep you from going back to that thing. You stole from somebody. You messed up somebody's life. Oh, I feel so bad about that. Well, thank the Lord. I don't want you ever to feel good about that. But you ought to feel forgiven about that. You ought to know that God loves you anyway. God accepts you just as you are. God will take your old life and make that life new. Praise the Lord. That's what God will do for you if you let him. A few years ago in Auckland, New Zealand, something awful happened. What I'm about to share with you is not for the faint of heart. It's awful. A young lady, 18 years of age, was driving back from her boyfriend's house. It was early in the morning, 2 o'clock. She wasn't drunk, she wasn't stoned. For some reason, she lost control of her car on the motorway, freeway. Crashed her car. Some good Samaritans stopped to help her. Postal workers, a meat truck delivery driver guy, and an off-duty policeman. They stopped to help her. The girl had two major problems. One, because of the nature of the crash, she was pinned in the car. 
her feet were stuck. That was problem number one. Problem number two was that the vehicle was on fire. They tried to get her out, but they couldn't. The policeman fought the heat to the extent that he had some of the flesh on his hand burned away down to the bone. One man said, he went in through the back door. I tried to get in through the front door. We just couldn't. And then the flames and the heat just drove us back. He said, the problem was she wasn't badly hurt at all. Just a couple of bumps. That's all. No major injury. She was in her right mind. She was lucid. She was communicating. But we couldn't get her out. He said, at one point, she grabbed my arm and said, don't leave me here, I'm going to die. But we had to get out. He said, we were shaking and we felt like crying. You would, wouldn't you? Some thousands of years ago, there was a wreck in the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve did something they should not have done. They ate some fruit that God had expressly forbidden them to eat. They ate it anyway. And that's when the car hit the guardrail on the freeway. It was a disaster and they were separated from God. But a good Samaritan happened to come by. He could have just passed him by, but he didn't. And he stopped and he said, you know something, I'll get you out of there. Now Adam and Eve were stuck, not by their feet, but they were stuck by their sins. They couldn't get out of there, not possible. But Jesus said, I will free you. Oh, there's a fire coming one day. But don't worry about that. I will set you free. You've just got to choose to be set free. Accept what I will do for you. I will lose more for you than just the meat on my hand. I'll give my life for you. The blood will drain out of my body to the extent that then the water's going to start flowing. So what about it? Do you want to stay stuck here in this wreckage of sin? Or would you like to go free? And Adam and Eve had the good sense to say, we'll go free. Friend, what about you tonight? Would you let Jesus free you? You can't get yourself out. There's no other way out. Jesus has paid the price. He's purchased your pardon. He's made it possible. And all it rests for you to do is say, Jesus, set me free. Jesus, set me free. It's a simple prayer. Jesus, give me a new heart. I accept what you want to give me. Tonight, I accept it. Jesus, set me free. Would you like to pray that prayer with me tonight? Jesus, set me free. Bow your head with me where you are. Would you do that? We're going to pray just very briefly. Father in heaven, we want to be set free tonight. I pray that you would set us free. And I pray that each one in this place would have the good sense or would know or would feel drawn by you to allow you to set us free. Oh, friend, if you want to be set free tonight, would you raise your hand where you are? Just where you are, lift it up. Just raise your hand. Lord, I want to be set free. We thank you for your goodness tonight and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.